Okay, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. So in the next part of my talk, what I want to talk about, remember last time we proved that theorem called the Furstenberg orbit closure theorem, which classified orbits of points under the actions of non-lacanary sub-semigroups of the natural numbers. So now I want to talk about measure theoretic results. I want to talk about something called measure rigidity. Uh, I guess that's what I'll call this section. And just to begin with, I know that this is getting towards the end of the summer school, but I would like to do a little bit of a review of certain topics and dynamics. This is going to be a very fast review. My reason for doing this is because there are some things that I want to talk about, like entropy, that weren't covered in the other lectures. So just to begin with, let me tell you my notation. Here's the review. I'm not going to prove the things I'm going to tell you. The setting here is I'm going to suppose in most of what I'm doing that I'm working in a compact metric space. That makes life easy. And it makes the theorems very nice and clean. I'm going to, if I write script B like this, I'm talking about the Borel sigma algebra, the sigma algebra generated by the collection of all open sets in my space. Borel sigma algebra. Um, I'm going to assume, oh, and uh, for if I write script M, script M is going to denote the set of all probability measures on the measurable space XB. Set of probability measures on the measurable space XB. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just in the interest of, of uh, note taking, what's, what is for? Like, like, this is section four of, of what? Uh, maybe you're asking me what 1, 2, and 3 were. Uh, yes. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> this is the third lecture you've given. But I, I was, I, I, I'm assuming that there were a 1, 2, and 3, but I don't remember what they were. So if you want, you can call this 1. We can just keep the numbering like within the, within the sections. It's up to you. You can call it whatever you want. I can just erase the 4 if you like here. Is that all right? It's still the same contents. Sorry. No, it's all right. Um, now, I'm going to assume that I have a map T from my space to itself. I mean, since I'm working in a topological space, I want to assume that the map is continuous. And given this map T, I'm going to let M sub T denote the collection of probability measures which are invariant with respect to T. So the collection of mu's in M with the property that mu of, mu of A is equal to mu of T inverse of A for all A in the Borel sets, in the Borel sigma algebra. Okay. So by the way, I mean, you, you guys have probably already heard this or discovered it or already know this, but the, the space M is also a compact metric space. You, do, you, do you realize that? There's a natural topology on it. So I'm going to, when I talk about convergence in M or when I talk about things that have to do with topological properties of M, I'm assuming that it's equipped with the weak start topology. Do you understand why that's, do you, does everybody sort of clear about why that works? Nobody really talked about it that much. You, you might have heard of the Reese representation theorem. It tells you that every positive measure can be identified in a natural way with a, with a linear functional. And on the space of linear functionals of a compact metric space is a natural topology. And if you just transfer that topology to the space of probability measures, you get what's called the weak start topology. So I'm going to assume that M is equipped with the weak start topology. I'm not going to delve too much into this. It's, in order to really understand some of the arguments, you do need to really understand this topology. But this is just for clarity about what I mean. I'm just going to tell you at the beginning here. Um, so now let me, let me give you a little lemma. I'm just going to summarize a few properties about M and MT. So property number one is that the space M in the weak start topology is compact. It's, it's metrizable. Those are pretty easy to, to prove. Property number two, I thought about setting these as exercises on the sheet, but these are pretty standard facts that you can find in, in any book on ergodic theory, let's say. Introductory course in ergodic theory. If I take the collection of T invariant probability measures, that's a non -empty. it's non empty. We already saw that before, I think in Will's first lecture. Isn't that right? Oh Will Will Will's not here. 
it's closed. Um, it's convex. It's convex. And so there's a. Oh, oh. So I'm skipping. I'm skipping ahead. There's one more thing that I want to tell you about this. And this, this, re, this requires a proof. This is an important fact, though. The if you look at the collection of extreme points in this in this uh, closed convex set, if I call that E script E sub T script E sub T the set of extreme points in M T. Um, are precisely the measures which are ergodic. A lot of you probably already know this, but for the sake of people who don't know it, it's worth saying these things. Precisely the, the measures in MT, which are ergodic. So there's this nice geometric description of what the ergodic measures are. They're the extreme points in the space MT. Okay? Ergodic with respect to T. OK, if you combine this with a, uh, l let, me, let me tell you a couple, of, a couple more facts that I'm actually going to need at some point in proofs that I'm going to show you. So fact number one is that uh, if I have two distinct ergodic measures, what do you, OK, for, this, is, this, is, this is a preview of the final exam. If I have two distinct ergodic measures, what, do you, what can I say about them? Or what do you think I'm going to say? Oh, what do you think I'm going to say about them? <laughs> Well, <laughs> I give you a hit. <laughs> They're mutually singular, OK? That means that you can decompose your, your space into a union of two measurable sets. And one of the measures is supported on one, and the other is supported on the other. So the measure of one of the sets is 0, the mu measure, and the new measure of the other one is 0. OK? Important fact. Very, very useful fact. Okay, fact number two. This is totally non. This is a. Uh, this is uh, not obvious. Okay, fact number two. There's this theorem. There's a general theorem called the Choquet decomposition theorem, which gives you something that people refer to as the ergodic decomposition theorem. And um, it tells you that if if you have any t invariant measure, you can write it as a convex combination of the ergodic measures. Now the, the the set of all ergodic measures may not be some finite set. This might not be a, a like a this convex set may not be like a triangle or something. It may be something that's much more complicated. There may be uncountably many ergodic measures, like in the case with the times two map, what we saw with the Bernoulli measures. Um, so this is the ergodic decomposition theorem. What it says is that if I uh, have any t invariant measure mu for any mu in MT. I can find a probability measure on MT. There exists a probability measure. I'm going to have to digest this a little bit. A probability measure, lambda, on MT, which is supported on the extreme points. On the extreme points, such that the measure mu is equal to the integral over, M, over et. I could write over mt, but since the measure is supported on the extreme points, I can write over, integral over et of m d lambda of m. Okay. Now, can I take a moment to, to explain this to you? Because this may be all weird if you never thought about it before. Um, mt, remember, it's a topological space. And so it has Borel sets, and the Borel sets generate a sigma algebra. So when I'm talking about a probability measure on MT, I'm talking about a, a measure which is, support, which is measurable on that space. Okay? So there's a probability measure on MT, and the support of the measure is ET. I'll tell you, I can tell you what that means in a minute if you don't know what the support of a measure is. I tell you what, if you don't know what it is, you can ask me later, and I'll tell you. I don't want to get too hung up on it. It, it means, for one, that it gives the complement of the set measure 0. Okay? And what does it mean to say that mu can be written as an integral over, e, over et of m d lambda of m? Well, this is kind of the recipe for how you, how, you, how you integrate with respect to mu. If I want to integrate something d mu, if I want to integrate f d mu, I would just put the integral of f dm on the inside, and then I would integrate with respect to lambda m on the outside. Okay? 
Does it make sense? Yeah, so to, you, know, you might know what it means to say, like, if, if, I, if I tell you that one measure is one half of another measure plus a half of another measure, that's sort of a recipe for how to integrate with respect to the new measure. You take a half of the integral with respect to your first measure plus a half of the integral with respect to your second measure. This is the same thing, except for it's an integral. This is the recipe for how to integrate with something with respect to mu. So for example, in, in the 1 half of 1 plus 1 half of the other, that in, in that example, lambda would be a point measure on these two measures. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that's the simple case where your where you're, where you're, um, space is just a little line segment or something, and you have two extreme points. Okay. Good. Now, let's talk about entropy. Somebody at some point has to say something about the ergodic decomposition in the, in the summer school. That's what I was thinking. And I'm also going to use it if I can ever get that far. I need to erase faster if I want to get that far. So my phone tells me that I'm getting a workout. I don't know if that's really true. It doesn't feel like it, but maybe. So now I tell you about entropy. I'm not going to give you the whole philosophical background about what entropy is, where it comes from, and what it's used for. It's a measure of how much information a certain dynamical system um, gives you, how much information knowing, uh, knowing the orbit of a dynamical system gives you. Like I said, I'm not going to go into the details. There's plenty of places where you can look to figure that out. I'm going to tell you the definition, or I'm going to tell you a definition. Maybe at the very beginning, I can preface this by saying there's two, there's two main kinds of entropy. There's topological entropy, and there's measure theoretic entropy. And they're connected by something called the variational principle. So first of all, let me tell you what topological entropy is. Preface subpoint number one. There are many different definitions of topological entropy, and most of them are equivalent. So the definition that I'm giving you may not be the definition that you've seen before, but it, it's most likely equivalent to the definition that you've seen before. So this is Bowen's definition of topological entropy. And here's the way that I want to define it. Pick a natural number n and pick, a, pick an epsilon bigger than 0. I need to tell you what it means to say that a set is an n epsilon separated set with respect to t. So we say that a set a in our compact metric space x is n epsilon separated. Oh, that's an m. n epsilon separated with respect to the map t if for every pair of points in my set a, for every alpha and beta in a, with alpha not equal to b, the max i going from 0 up to n minus 1 of the distance from t to the i alpha to t to the i beta is bigger than or equal to epsilon. Okay, Is it clear? Epsilon is how far apart the, the you, you want to see the points at some, at some step. N is how far out you have to go in the orbit to ensure that there is at least one iterate which pushes the points at least epsilon apart. Okay, So you look at the initial part of the orbit of, your done, uh, the orbit of alpha and beta under the maps t to the i, i going from 0 to n minus 1. N epsilon separated means that there's at least one step in that process where the two points in the orbit that you see are going to be separated by at least epsilon. Okay? And what I want to do now is I want to let s sub n of t epsilon be the cardinality of a largest, um, let me say it this way, denote the largest cardinality of an epsilon separated set. of an n epsilon separated set in x. And now I can d tell you what the topological entropy of my dynamical system is. So don't need that yet. Whoops. The topological entropy of my map t is defined to be, I'm going to use the notation h sub top, top of t. And what it is is it's the limit as epsilon tends to 0 of the limb soup as n tends to infinity of s sub n t epsilon 
divided by n, okay? So you pick some epsilon and then you consider the largest cardinality of an epsilon, epsilon separated set. Oh, just give me one minute to think about this. Yeah, no, that's right. OK? Divide by n and then take the limit as you tend to infinity. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. There needs to be a log. log. So does there need to be a log n as well then? That's the question. I think that's, I think that's OK. Yeah, thank you. That's what was confusing me. Thank you. So to be clear, it's, it's log of <coughs> Sn t over n. OK, all over n. Yeah. OK. OK, now um, here's, the, here's the thing. So this is something that doesn't depend on any measure that I've chosen. Now I want to tell you what the, how the measure theoretic entropy of a dynamical system is defined. And before I do that, I have to tell you how the measure theoretic entropy of a partition of my space x is defined. So pick your favorite t invariant measure. Let me, let me pick mu. And let's assume that you're given um, a finite partition of the space x into measurable sets. So p is a finite partition. Of x, okay? Yeah. Maybe there's something that I'm not understanding about this definition of topological entropy. But how do we know, for example, that S N T epsilon is is finite? No, you don't. You don't. Yeah, okay. but in our examples here, in in our oh no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because it's compact. Yeah. Okay. Because we assume that x is compact. Yeah. Okay. Good question, though. So uh, here's the deal. Pick a finite partition of your, of your set. And let's define the measure theoretic entropy of the partition. The measure theoretic entropy of the partition is defined to be minus the sum over the elements of your partition of mu of p times log of mu of p. Now, I need to make a couple more definitions, and this is going to, I'm sorry for so many definitions. But I actually do need these definitions. And I don't have time to do a ton of examples. I put one example in my exercises. and. So. So this is, this, is the, this is the entropy of a, of, a, of a finite partition. And what I also want to define at this point is I want to define h, little h sub mu of the partition of, uh, part, of t comma p to be the limit as n tends to infinity. Hopefully I've gotten this correct this time, yes. Okay. As n tends to infinity of 1 over n times the mu the capital H sub mu entropy of the partition. Here's something which you may or may not have seen before. Join i equals 0 to n minus 1 of t to the minus i p. Okay. So this is the common refinement of the collection of finite partitions that you get by taking preimages under iterates of the map t. I'm gonna, I can write down the definition for you. It's nothing that's really that mysterious. So what is that, that object, that join, the triangle i equals 0 to n minus 1 of t to the minus i p? Uh, well, it's the collection of all intersections of sets of the form where p i is in t to the minus i of p. Okay. OK? So what I really mean is where pi, where pi is t to the minus i of, of one of the elements of the partition. Does it make sense? OK? 
Now I can tell you what the measure theoretic entropy is. The, the measure theoretic entropy of a measure with respect to t, I'll say of t with respect to mu, is defined to be the supremum over all partitions, over all finite partitions of h sub mu of tp. Okay. Okay, so what do I want to tell you about this? I need to tell you a couple facts about it. And this is in preparation for things that I want to say in just a moment here. So facts, number one, people, so I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about this myself. People say entropy is affine. I would say entropy is linear, but for some reason, everybody says entropy is affine. Maybe someone can explain that to me. So entropy is affine. And what that means is that if I take the entropy of a linear combination, of a convex combination of probability measures, let's say, I get the, I get the sum of the entropy. So how have I written this here? Entropy of mu 1 t plus entropy of mu 2 t. I guess I should put my convex combination down here. The entropy of mu 1 plus mu 2 um, is the entropy of mu 1 times entropy of mu 2. Okay. Okay. So in particular, if, you're, if you combine this with, I'm not actually proving anything. If you combine this with the ergodic decomposition that I showed you, then if you're taking the entropy of a measure, the entropy of a measure is the integral of the entropy of the measures m d lambda of m. Okay. Now, what else do I want to say? I also want to tell you something called the variational principle. This is pretty important. The variational principle tells you that if you take the supremum over all possible values of the measure theoretic entropy over all t invariant measures mu, you're going to end up getting the topological entropy. Okay. Supremum over mu and m t of h sub mu of t. I hope that I've used the same notation here. Okay. And there's also some other stuff that I could tell you about generators and other things like that. But let, 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 I, I actually do want to tell you that stuff, but I don't have infinite time. And so maybe I can just tell you one other thing that I'm actually going to need to use at some point here. All of these things that I'm telling you, everything that I've told you so far, it can be found, for example, in Peter Walter's book on our good theory. Okay. Stuff in entropy, I think, is in the last chapter or towards the end. Number three thing that I want to tell you, I don't have a reference for this. I tried to look for one, but I couldn't find one. If one of you can tell me a reference for this, I'd appreciate it. Um, if the entropy of a measure is 0, but this is a commonly used fact, then you can find a subset of your space x with the property that the measure of the complement is 0 and such that when you consider the dynamical system that you get by restricting, well, let me just, let me just to avoid lengthy, lengthy sentences, and the dynamical system that you get by restricting your original one to x prime is measurably conjugate. to Tx and invertible, OK? And invertible. So people kind of people phrase this by saying that entropy 0 systems are deterministic, or that entropy 0 systems are invertible modulo 1. It means that you can throw out a set of measures 0, essentially, so that your dynamical system is invertible on the resulting set, OK? OK, now let me 
return to my main line of thought and continue what I was talking about yesterday. Yesterday we talked about the Furstenberg orbit closure theorem. Now I want to tell you about a conjecture in dynamical systems, which is called Furstenberg's conjecture. Furstenberg orbit closure theorem was a theorem about orbits of points. The Furstenberg conjecture is a conjecture about times 2 times 3 invariant measures. I'll just state it for times 2 and times 3. Furstenberg conjecture. It's called the times 2 times 3 conjecture. What it says is that if you have a non-atomic probability measure, non-atomic means it doesn't give positive measure to a single point in your space. Probability measure. Which is invariant under the action. of every element of every element sigma in the multiplicative semigroup generated by 2 and 3 then mu is the beck measure okay okay do you understand the statement of the conjecture? You know, in general, the space of the space of probability measures, the space of t-invariant probability measures on a compact metric space is much richer than the collection of orbits in general. Just look at the times two map. We already sort of encountered that yesterday. You have a lot of measures whose support is the full interval. Okay. What the first number conjecture says is that the space of measures, if you're if you're considering a Non-lacanary sub, a uh, non-lacanary semigroup of positive integers acting on the circle, then the space of measures is actually very small. It's just the, the measures that you get by considering finite orbits and Lebesgue measure, and that's it. And if some of you are wondering why I didn't put the word ergodic in here, you don't have to put ergodic in here because you have the ergodic decomposition. Okay. So some people state this by saying that you have a um, an invariant measure which is also ergodic for the action. But we have the ergodic decomposition as well, which tells us that if Lebesgue measure and these finite measures are the only ergodic measures, then the statement is true. So what's the space that we're working on in this first Oh, yeah. OK. So now let, let, me, let me just, maybe I should tell you that, right? I'm returning to the scene of yesterday where x is the circle. Oh, OK. And uh, yeah, I should be more precise about, about what I'm trying to say. I'm returning to the scene of yesterday. I'm going back to the case where I'm on the circle, and I'm considering how integers act by multiplication modulo 1. So I'm on the circle, and I'm considering measures which are invariant under the action of multiplication by, the, by these integers, modulo 1. If I have a measure which is invariant under the action of all of these, then the claim is that unless it's, a, unless it's the kind of measure which gives positive measure to some point in the space, it has to be a Lebesgue measure. It's an open pro famous open problem. Which inspired a lot of important work in dynamical systems. And the work that it inspired has applications to so many different problems across mathematics. It's, it's incredible. So this is actually an important conjecture from, from that point of view. So Rudolph's theorem. Here's another theorem, which is a kind of a landmark theorem, often quoted. There are actually a lot of results which give partial results to first and burst conjecture. A lot of beautiful results, which are partial results to first and burst conjecture. I don't have time to list out all the ones I know. And all the ones I know are probably not all the results anyway. So I'll tell you one of the most famous ones. One of the most famous ones is this theorem by Rudolph. Rudolph's theorem says, if I have a measure mu, which is, can I, can I call this semigroup sigma? So I don't have to, I'll call it sigma sub 2, 3, to be clear that that's the semigroup that we're talking about. Okay. If mu is sigma 2, 3 invariant and ergodic,
and sigma t3 ergodic. I'll tell you what that means. Okay. Then, oh, I should say I need one more little phrase here. And if there is at least one measure, if there is at least one element of sigma which acts with positive entropy, which acts with positive mu entropy, mu entropy, OK? Then mu is the Beck measure. OK? Now, to be clear what I'm talking about, because in, when I, at the beginning, when I gave you the review, I was talking about the action of one map t. But here I have a whole family of maps. Actually, here I have two maps. I have the times two map, and I have the times three map. And I'm, I'm allowed to apply them in any order that I want. So what I mean to say that mu is sigma 2, 3 invariant, that's exactly what I, what I already told you in the statement of Furstenberg's theorem. It means that if you pick any element of the semigroup, your measure mu is invariant with respect to the action of that element. Okay, That's easy to understand. The other one is also easy to understand, but I should still tell you the definition. What does it mean for mu to be sigma 2, 3 ergodic? Sigma 2, 3 ergodic means that if you have a measurable set, a, a measurable subset of the circle um, such that sigma inverse of a equals a for every a, sigma in sigma 2, 3, then the measure of a is 0 or 1. Okay? It's a lot like what it means to just be ergodic. But you see, the thing is that um, to pass this test is a sort of a strict requirement, right? If I just said that the measure mu was times 3 ergodic, that wouldn't be a strict, because then it would just have to pass the test for that one map. But now, I'm allowing a lot more sets to not have to satisfy this requirement, because there's a lot more sets that don't satisfy this requirement. Make sense, what I'm saying? And so that's the, that's the subtlety of Rudolph's theorem. I was actually originally thinking about giving a proof of Rudolph's theorem, but when I was writing my lecture notes, they, just, they, got, they were blowing up like ridiculously. And so instead of giving a proof of Rudolph's theorem, Rudolph's theorem what I'm going to prove instead is a weak Rudolph theorem. And that this theorem that I'm going to prove is it was originally, it's from an idea that's due, due, I believe, to Russell Lyons. And it was, a, it was the motivation for the idea behind Rudolph's proof. So Rudolph modified the idea in order to give his proof of his theorem. So what I'm going to prove is something called the weak, well, which I'm calling the weak Rudolph theorem. Weak, it doesn't seem that much different. You won't even notice the difference. So what I'm going to prove is that if mu is sigma 2, 3 invariant, you're good with respect to t3. Uh, it, OK, t3 is going to be multiplication by 3 on the, on the unit circle. You're good with respect to t3. T3 is the map which sends x to 3x mod 1. And if the times 2 map, T2, acts with positive entropy, then the measure mu is the Beck measure. Okay. Mu equals the Beck measure. OK? You, you, do you see why this, why this is weaker than the one that came above it? It's a very, it's a very, it seems like a very small difference. Um, actually, Rudolph's theorem is a, quite a bit more, the proof of Rudolph's theorem is quite a bit more complicated. So in the statement here, I'm only assuming that my Measure is ergodic with respect to the one map T3. What does that 
mean? Well, there's a lot more sets which satisfy the property that t3 inverse of a equals a. And so that's forcing all of those sets to have measure 0 or 1. So it's placing a very strong restriction on the measure. When I, in, in the proof of Rudolph's theorem, I'm, I'm weakening that restriction a lot. I'm letting a lot of those sets sort of get a free pass. I'm not even going to consider them because even though t3 inverse of a may be a, maybe, maybe t9 inverse, oh, maybe t, I better be careful, t6 inverse of a is not, is not a. OK? Are t2 and t3 symmetric in the sense that is it the same if I just take the mu um, to be, I got it, t2 and a uh, good question. Yeah, we can we can try to see that when we do the proof. Okay. I don't know the answer right. I think it probably is, but uh, it's not obvious to me until we look at the proof. Okay. okay. Now, is there anything else that I want to say with regard to this? Well, maybe I can tell you one thing really quick before before I show you the proof of the weak Rudolph theorem. Maybe I can tell you what in the world this has to do with Diophantine approximation. Would you like to know that? Because the title of my course is supposed to be Application of Dynamics to Diophantine Approximation. And so let me try to give you a little bit of a, a, a road map or a little bit of a picture to show you what's behind the scenes here. And if I have time eventually, I'm going to show you how you can use a modification of some of these ideas to prove a result that's directly in Diophantine Approximation. For now, let me just try to explain to you what the, what the bigger picture is that connects these results with Diophantine Approximation. So in the, in, in the lectures that we've looked at, we've seen a few different dynamical systems that we know have something to do with Diophantine approximation. We've seen circle rotations. Actually, should I write circle rotations or should I write not rotations? Should I, I'll write endomorphisms of the circle. Okay. Endomorphisms of the circle. A little bit different in dynamical language. Um, we've seen the, the diagonal action on on SL2R quotient SL2Z. I still am going to quotient on the left. I don't really care. I'm not I'm not that particular about it, but I'm just going to stick with what I said in the first lecture. And um, we also saw diagonal action on higher rank groups. So in particular, we saw something about diagonal action. On should be the word on here. On SL3R mod SL3Z. This came up in Anisha's talk towards the end. Okay. And now I will try to paint the picture here. So with endomorphisms of the circle, there's a well, first of all, we can consider one parameter actions. And what I mean by that, if I'm talking about endomorphisms of the circle, I'm talking about the action of lacanary semigroups, like the times 2 map or the times 3 map by itself. And in that case, what we, what we saw is that there's many possible orbits. right? There are many different distinct orbits of points that you can see. Same thing when you consider SL2R mod SL2Z, the diagonal action. There are many different orbits. And it, what is that related to? Do you guys remember? What are the orbits of points under the action of this, of the diagonal group here related to? Well, it, it depends on what lattice you choose in the beginning. But if you choose the right lattice, they're related in some way to badly approximable, to how well approximable a number is, or to the continued fraction expansion of the number. Those of you, you guys who are doing chapter 9, if you get further into chapter 9 of Einstein's either in Ward's book, you'll see there's a direct connection between the Gauss map and the orbits of those points under, the, under this one parameter action. How far they go up in the cusp and how long they spend there, it depends exactly, precisely, on the partial quotients in the continued fraction expansion. So here we see that there's a connection to Diophantine approximation in the background. Also, by the way, you know in the Oppenheim conjecture, the, the quadratic forms have, have uh, at least three variables. It's not true for two variables because of this reason. There are, there are bounded orbits. Okay. So for SL3R mod SL3Z, again, if I'm considering, now let me just tell you one thing about, about SL3R mod SL3Z, which is different. Here are di the diagonal group, or let's say the positive diagonal group. Uh, let, let me write it the other way. Let me write e to the minus t minus s, e to the t, e to the s. Here the positive diagonal group, it looks like, it looks like this, right? I'll call this, I'll call the group A. 
And here there's two, there's two parameters that you can choose from. There's sort of two different directions that you can go in. Now, if you choose a one-parameter subflow of the, of the diagonal group, if I, for example, I choose s equal to t, and I consider what happens when I, when I let t run through, the, run, run through the positive reals, I'm going to have a one-parameter action on my space. And in that case, again, it turns out that there are many different possible orbits of points that you can see. This has something to do. Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with in just a moment here. It has something to do with a two-dimensional version of badly approximable numbers. So now let's talk about two parameter actions. Well, for two parameter actions, um, I want to divide my I want to divide what I want to say into three categories. I want to divide it into topological results, topological. I want to talk about um, measure theory, conjecture. So the con what the conjectured results are. And I want to talk about measure theory theorem, <laughs> what we can actually prove. Okay. OK, well, now help me fill in the, the chart here. What can you tell me about topological? What do I mean even by topological? I mean, let's not talk about measures. Let's just talk about orbits of points and what the closures of orbits look like. That's what I mean. What can you tell me? What's a topological? Result about two parameter actions, endomorphisms of the circle. That's Furstenberg's theorem that we proved, the Furstenberg Rabi closure theorem, right? That gives us a complete description of what all the different possible Furstenberg orbit closure theorem, of what all the different possible topological behaviors are, all the different orbit closures. Now, if I am OK, there's no two parameter action in SLC. Let me just put blocks, cross this out there, OK? Because <laughs> the diagonal group is, is a one parameter action, OK? In SL3R mod SL3Z, well, I tell you what, just to keep the suspense. So let's come back over here. What's the measure theory conjecture? Well, that's the Furstenberg conjecture that we just now talked about, right? And uh, what's the measure theory theorem? Well, the measure theory theorem, there are lots of theorems. The one that I just now told you is Rudolph's theorem. Rudolph's theorem. Now, maybe I could also say one of, the, one of the goals, if I can actually get there, which is not looking that promising, but I, I might just have to sort of cut some things out because I do want to tell you this. I want to tell you about how, these, how knowing, stuff, knowing these kind of measure theory results and knowing these kind of techniques for studying measure theory, um, for studying measure rigidity of endomorph, of, endomorphisms of the circle. I want to explain to you how that can be used to prove new results about this conjecture called the mixed Littlewood conjecture. That's going to be the last thing I talk about. It's already true that Furstenberg's orbit closure theorem tells you something about the piatic Littlewood conjecture. And that's going to be on the final exam. I'll ask you, on, I'll ask you tomorrow. <laughs> OK, so what about diagonal actions? Well, the, well, here's the thing. This is kind of weird. Um, in terms of. The measure theory conjecture, there's a conjecture here called Margulis' conjecture, which is an analog of the Furstenberg conjecture. I can tell you what Margulis' conjecture says. I can write it down for you if you want, or I'll just tell you in words. What it says is that if you, if you have a measure on this quotient space, which is invariant and ergodic for the action of the full diagonal group, then it has to be a measure, which is Haar measure, supported on some closed subgroup. Okay. And so it's an, it's an analog, it's a direct analog of the Furstenberg conjecture for times 2 times 3 invariant measures. Now, what people can actually prove here, and this is pretty recent, this is from 2000 and the early 2000s, maybe 2003 or something here. There's a theorem by Ein Ziedler, Katok, and Linden Strauss. And what it tells you is that. If you have an invariant and ergodic measure which acts with positive entropy, it tells you exactly what Rudolph's theorem tells you, but it tells you it for SL3R mod SL3Z. Then it has to be Haar measure on the space. Now, I left one thing blank here, which is the topological stuff. And what you would hope for here is that if you have a kind of if you have an irrational point in SL3R mod SL3Z, maybe you would hope that when you act by the two-parameter subgroup by the diagonal matrices, 
you get an orbit which is dense. Actually, we don't, we don't know how to prove that. And that's an open problem. I wish I knew how to prove that, because if you knew how to prove that, it would imply the Littlewood conjecture. Okay. So the, would you like me to tell you more about that, or would you like me to move on and show you how to prove weak Rudolph? Who wants to hear about why this, how this is related to the Littlewood conjecture? A few people? OK, I just tried to tell you really quick. This is nothing very, I'm, I'm, I'm butchering this a little bit. I'd just like to admit that, because this is on video, and some of the people who wrote these papers might watch it later. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> And so that's my disclaimer. Like their, their paper is 40 pages long, and it's not at all um, easy. It's, it's very well written. Thank you. <laughs> you owe me? You owe me? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it is a very well written paper, actually. And I'm talking about the Einstein, Katoka, and Linda Stress paper. But let me just butcher a few things here and tell you very, very quickly. And also the quotient on the right. So don't be confused if you read their paper. Because it's going to be, my matrix is probably going to be the transpose of theirs. So here's the, here's the thing. You remember in SL2R mod SL2Z. Ah! Stupid. It's too, so stupid to get hung up about this. OK. You remember in here we, had, we, we said, and I hope I'm getting this right. We said if we take the, if we take the lattice SL2Z, um, times 1 alpha 0, 1. And we consider the right diagonal action. I might have put the wrong diagonal action last time I did this. Or I might be putting it wrong now. It's either e to the t to the minus t or the other way around. Okay, um, And maybe it doesn't matter. Mm, no, no, the way I said it before was right, because I actually did the computation. Remember, you can do it either way, in fact. But the point is, you, you flow in one direction. And you want to you want to look at what happens as you as you vary t, as you let t run from 0 to infinity. So here's a picture of SL2R mod SL2Z. Now you can understand why I drew it that way, right? Because you can identify PSL2R mod PSL2Z with the unit tangent bundle of the, of, um, the upper half plane quotiented out, by a, quotiented out by a subgroup. So if there's a fundamental domain that looks like this, where you emit certain boundary points and things like that. Okay. It's non-compact. It goes up forever. And we know that to the, there's a characterization of badly approximable numbers alpha. Alpha is badly approximable if and only if it lives in some compact part of the orbit. So alpha is badly approximable if and only if, when you flow around, um, you stay inside of some compact region. Okay. And badly approximable numbers do exist. They're, they're out there. They're dimension one set, like what we said in the first lecture. So there are these orbits. Now in SL3R mod SL3Z, The way that you can, one way that you can attack the Littlewood conjecture is you can consider the lattice SL30, and I hope that I'm doing this the right way around here. You can consider this lattice. Okay? Now, uh, the action is this two parameter action, e to the minus t minus s, e to the t, e to the s. The rest are all zeros in here, diagonal matrix. SL3R met SL3Z, once again, is a Non-compact region. It has some fundamental domain, which you can sit around and think about. I tried it. It wasn't very successful. But you, you can describe it using, cer using certain algebraic inequalities. And um, now the point is that there's exactly this. You can, you can also study this two-parameter two flow right, in the space. I don't know how to draw it. You flow around in the space. Maybe I'll just draw it as if it were just a line winding around, even though it's kind of a lie. Okay, you flow around the space when you act with this two-parameter flow. You actually flow in two di two different directions. Okay. Now there's a characterization which which is that which is this, <coughs> the orbit here. T and s bigger than or equal to zero. Is unbounded. I'll, I'll phrase it that way. Unbounded. If and only if. The Infimum over all natural numbers n of n times double bar n alpha times double bar n beta is equal to zero. So there's a there's a way of embedding the Littlewood problem into this. Di uh, there's a way of interpreting the Littlewood problem as a problem about this diagonal action on the space SL3 R mod SL3 Z. Now that's not incredibly deep. It's not it's not as obvious as the thing for badly approximable numbers was. The proof is about a page long, and it's towards the end of the EKL paper. So if you want to see why that's true, you can look there. It's elementary proof. 
It also uses Mueller's compactness criterion in some place. And so the, you can sort of see why um, Margulis's conjecture, or l l l let me just back up to the question mark right here. If you, knew, if you had a way of proving an analog of the Furstenberg orbit closure theorem, which told you that every orbit was dense inside of the space, you would automatically prove the Littlewood conjecture. In fact, you don't even need to know that every orbit is dense. You just need to know that every orbit is unbounded, and then you prove the Littlewood conjecture. Okay? So, the, so that's it. That's all that I really want to say about this. Maybe the one other thing that I will say is that the famous result at the end of this paper, which is also stated in the introduction, is that the set of alpha and beta which do not satisfy the Littlewood conjecture is a countable union of sets with box dimension 0. So it has Hausdorff dimension 0. So the set of exceptions to the Littlewood conjecture has dimension 0. That's what they prove. How do they prove that? They prove it, let me just explain very briefly, because this is the same ingredients that's going to go into another proof that I'm going to explain to you. If you had a set of exceptions which had positive dimension, I haven't even defined dimension yet, so don't worry, I'm going to explain it. But when you see the defini definition of dimension, you're going to see it. It's going to remind you of the definition of entropy. If you, if you have a set of exceptions which has positive dimension, then you can use it, you can flow it out, and you can use it to create an A-invariant an a invariant set um, which supports a measure that has positive entropy. Then you can use this theorem which tells you that if you have an A-invariant and ergodic measure which, for which the diagonal group acts with positive entropy, then it has to be Haar measure. Haar measure doesn't have compact support. And so you reach a contradiction. Okay. Weak Rudolph theorem. Let's talk about this now. Let me let me see how much time I have. And what was me? This is this. I, I promise you, when I was preparing these lectures, that I thought this was going to take five minutes. And l let me see how much time I have left. Five minutes. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do the next five minutes now. I'm going to show you the proof of this weak Rudolph theorem because I'd like you to see how this sort of comes together. And then I'm going to have to go s next time sort of quickly through this explanation of how you can connect these ideas to mixed Littlewood conjecture. I think I can do that if I just uh, leave a few lemmas as, as exercises. All right, so let's start off with the proof of the weak Rudolph theorem. And let's do five minutes of the proof. And then we'll finish the rest of it next time. Like I said, this, the idea behind this proof, it, it goes back to Russell Lyons. It's been sort of reinvented a few times. It's been rediscovered or reused a few different places. So proof of we've we grew off. Let's, uh, let's, we've got these two maps from the statement of the theorem, the times three map and the times two map. And I want to introduce one map that's going to sort of connect them. And it's going to be the map which just takes a number and adds a half, modulo one. So let's let psi be the map from r mod z to r mod z defined by psi of x equals x plus a half mod one. And um, let me, I have my measure mu from the statement of the theorem, this 2, 3 invariant measure, which is ergodic with respect to T3 and which has positive entropy with respect to T2. Let me define another measure. And the, the other measure that I want to define is going to be the push forward of mu by the psi map. So I, I will define the measure nu to be psi star of mu. So all that means is that all that means is that if I want to integrate a function d nu, then I integrate f of f composed with psi d mu. Okay. Okay. And I, I want to let me tell you what I want to try to do. I want to prove that that mu, mu and nu are actually the same measure. I want to use the hypothesis to try to prove that mu and nu are actually the same measure. And then we're going to study the Fourier coefficients of the measure, and we're going to show that all of the Fourier coefficients are 0, except for the constant coefficient. That means it's got to be Lebesgue measure. Okay? So that's the plan of the proof. So how do you prove that these are the same measure? I'm going to do it in a few steps. And I'll, I'll do, I'll do it's a, this is actually a short proof. I, I can get most of it done, I think. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to show that nu is a um, times 3 invariant in ergodic measure. So how do I show that it's invariant? Well, let's consider what, what does nu do to t, t3 inverse of a set. 
I will just write down the definition. It's the integral over the indicator function of the set of psi composed with t3 of x, d mu of x. Okay. And uh, after a few manipulations here, this is the integral of the indicator function of a. of t3 of psi of x, d mu of x. So here I'm just using the fact that, that, that psi and t3 commute. So if I take times 3 and then I add a half, I'll get the same as if I add a half and then times 3, mod 1, right? And now, just one more computation here. This is the integral of the indicator function of a evaluated at psi of x d mu of x. And this is just because of the t3 invariance of mu, because mu is the t3 invariant measure. And now this is exactly the definition of what mu of, of, what mu of a is. And so this step that I just now showed you implies that mu is t3 invariant. That's the definition of what it means to be t3 invariant. Okay. So let me try to get to the, I, I have a couple minutes here. And let me just try to get to the point where I show that the two measures are the same, if I can. And I'm going to have to, so if you again use the fact, let me just leave the next part as an exercise. If you again use the fact that psi and t3 commute with each other, you can use the fact that mu is an ergodic measure to prove that nu is also ergodic, okay? Nu is ergodic with respect to t3. So by similar arguments. Using the, using the fact that the two maps commute, you can prove that nu is ergodic with respect to t3. OK? So that's step number one. So step number two, again, I'm going to have to go through this rather quickly. So now the fact that the entropy of mu with respect to t2 is positive, it means that T2 is not um, invertible modulo mu. So it means that there's no way to throw out a set of measures here to make the times 2 map invertible. Okay. So what, it, what that means, another way to say that is that you can find a, an element z in the support of the measure mu with the property that z plus a half is also in the support. Uh, OK, now, if you think about it, the, the map psi just interchanges these two points, z and z, and a half, z and z plus a half. It just switches them. And so what that, it, now you have to think about what the definition of the support of a measure is. If you think about it, you will realize that what this means is that the measures mu and nu cannot be mutually singular. Now, there is a little bit of thinking that has to go between that step and that step. You have to sort of think through why that's true. So once you know that mu and nu are not mutually singular, well, they're both t3 invariant and ergodic maps. And so that means that they have to be the same. And so we're almost there. We, now we just have to do the Fourier coefficient computation, and we'll be done. OK, uh, do I actually have two more minutes to do the computation? Where's Vaughn? Can I ask somebody for permission? Could I have two more minutes? I can't be the one in charge to say that. To say that. <laughs> Can we just do, are you guys, would you guys be all right if we just finish the computation? Because it's just one more step. OK, we are going to finish the computation. So the, the last thing that I want to do is I want to look at the Fourier coefficients of the measure. If you're not familiar with, that, with, the, with what those are, I don't have time to introduce and define everything. I can talk to you about it afterwards, about why, why the next step works in detail. But let me just do the calculation for the sake of people who are familiar with this. So if I, if I have an odd integer k, and I look at the Fourier, the kth Fourier coefficient of the measure k, so I'll tell you what the, I'll, 
Well, mu, mu and nu are the same. So the kth Fourier coefficient of k is the same as the kth Fourier coefficient of nu. Now here's the definition of what the kth Fourier coefficient of a measure is. It's the integral over this uh, of a measure on r minus e. Let's say it's the integral over the circle of e to the two e to the two pi i, k x d nu of x. Okay. So here e e of something is e to the two pi i. Okay. This is the definition of what the Fourier coefficient of a measure is. Well, now I just need to put in what the definition of nu is. So this is the integral of e of k, e to the 2 pi k psi of x d mu of x. Psi of x is just x plus a half. And so this is the integral of e to the 2 pi i of k over of, well, I'll go ahead and, I'll go ahead and write one more step here. e to the 2 pi of kx plus k over 2 d mu of x. And this is just minus the integral of e to the 2 pi kx d mu of x. And so what does this tell you about the kth Fourier coefficient of this measure? It tells you that the kth Fourier coefficient is 0 when k is odd. Okay. Now the fact that mu is a times 2 invariant measure means that the kth Fourier coefficient is the same as the 2 kth Fourier coefficient, is the same as the 4 kth Fourier coefficient. And so now I can put in all the powers of 2 for free. And I get that all of the Fourier coefficients are odd unless k is 0. mu hat of 2k equals mu hat of 4k equals mu hat of 8k equals 0. OK? So all of the Fourier coefficients are 0 except for the first Fourier coefficient. And that means that mu is the Beck measure, so I'm finished. OK? So that implies that mu hat of L, let's say, is equal to 0 for all L in Z, not 0. And if all of the Fourier coefficients of a measure vanish, um, except the first one, of course, stupid, right? Then the measure's got to be a Lebesgue measure. Okay. So that's one of the exercises. Just think about what the measure mu has to do to test functions. Okay. That's the end of the proof of the weak theorem. Okay, thank you. I have to stop there because I'm out of time. So thank you very much.